1. I will begin reading at verse 13. Job chapter 1, verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another that said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yeah, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine with their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men. And they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And Job arose, and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. You may be seated. One of my favorite Old Testament scriptures was in Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall arise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. You're good with the music. Isaiah suggests that God has our back and that regardless of the weapons that may form against us, tongues that rise against us, they will not prosper. Why are they forming? They're forming to discredit, to discourage, and to detach us from our faith and from our heritage. And he lets us know emphatically that the weapons will form, but not prosper. In the New Testament, in Matthew 16, 13 through 18, is another one of my favorite passages of Scripture. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say... You're John the Baptist, some say you're Elias, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're one of the prophets. He says unto them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou Simon bar Jonah. What does he say? For flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And what does he say? And the gates, you said the gates of what? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates, somebody shout the gates. 
The gates are entrances, their exits, their portals. The hell behind the gates are consistently coming to kill, steal, and to destroy. Jesus tells Peter, upon your confession, upon your confession of who I am, I will build my church on that. And the gates of what? Hell. Say it like you mean it. The gates of who? Hell. Shall not prevail. He does not say that they won't be persistent. Prevail means to win, but hell is not a winner. Heaven is. I wish I had a witness in here. Persist means continual. It means that it tries to bring its influence, its motives to sow discord and to divide. So hell will be persistent, but it and its gates shall not prevail. Shout that again. The gates of hell shall not prevail. This picture of the gates of hell is not only the place in scripture where we hear of gates as pertaining to the spirit dimension, but in Psalms 24, 7 through 10, one of our favorite scriptures, if you're a believer, lift up your head, O ye gates. Be what? Lifted up ye everlasting doors. And who comes in? The king of glory. Then he says, who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong, mighty, the Lord mighty, and battle. So when we start looking at the gates of hell and its gates and hell behind the gates, this is not the only force in the spirit realm that we have to look at and we don't have to be intimidated by a persistent enemy in the spirit realm that is trying to thrust its influence and try to sow discord into our life. Because when we start looking at this particular text, when the Ark of the Covenant had been taken and then David is coming back into the city with it, everybody's downtrodden, everybody's head is down, and he starts symbolizing the gates as people. And with this gate, it was a gate big enough that it was on a pulley that the people would have to pull the gate. And they would pull the gate to get the gate above the building. So he was trying to express to them, this is how high your head has to be because the king of glory is getting ready to come back in, which means there is no reason for you to have your head down because the gates of hell is trying to prevail against you. Lift up your head. Oh, ye gates. He's telling you, yes, we recognize that in the spirit there will be war, spiritual warfare. But you got to understand that you do not have to be threatened by what's behind the other gate. Somebody shout, the gates of hell, hell. shall not prevail. David commands us to lift up our head and assume the posture because the king is coming. That would simply mean that hell's champion is no match for heaven's champion. Oh, I wish I had a witness right there. Hell's champion is no match for heaven's champion. So when hell starts burning and churning and knocking at your door, you got to remember whose kingdom you're in. You're not a part of the kingdom of hell. You're not a part of the lower dimension. You are a part of a dimension that has so much backup, so much power, that if you would just shake yourself and realize that you're fearfully and wonderfully made and you're more than your flesh, you can just sneeze a glory and kill the enemy. I wish I had a witness in here. I want you to look at somebody, lay your hands on them and tell them you got way more power, way more power. Way more power than what you've been using. You're way more anointed than what you think you are. But you got to realize the kingdom that you're in. Well, in our text tonight, there was no difference. Hell's champion influencer has walked into a conversation 
in heaven. Hell's angel has walked into a conversation with Jesus, with God. And the Bible says that the hosts, the sons of God, were having a meeting. And while the sons of God were having a meeting, it says that Satan came. And he asked Satan, what are you doing? And Satan said, I'm walking to and fro, up and down, up and down the earth. And, and, and Jesus, God says, have you considered my servant Job? which I thought was an interesting statement because if the text is right, and I believe it is, it says that Job was perfect, he was upright, he was a blameless man, that he was the greatest man in the land of Oz, in the land of the East. And if this is true, which we believe it is true, why would God ask Satan, has he considered the strongest man in the East? I, you would think that he would choose somebody weak. You would think that he would choose who we would call somebody that don't have no business preaching, somebody that don't have no business singing. But that's if you stay in your mind because God's not a man. So when you start looking at how God looks at it, the truth of the matter is everybody in this room is the greatest in the earth. Wish I had a witness in here. If the scripture is true and he tells you that he's going to make your name great, then the truth of the matter is it's going to take a great attack to take down a great man or to take down a great woman. So you cannot allow the massiveness of the attack that's on your life to make you doubt what God has put inside of you. And if you don't believe that, the scripture even says that there's someone greater that's living inside of you. Greater is he that is what? Within me than he that's what? Within the world. So he's already telling you, you've got a deposit that is greater than your attacker. And so you've got to recognize what's coming up against you. And if that is the case, let me give you the topic of my message. Look at somebody and say, a hell of a day. Job is the greatest man. He's rich. He's wealthy. He has a beautiful family. The Bible starts describing everything that he has. And if you look at this text, and the beauty of this text, you will notice, if you're a Bible reader, and I want you to take these notes, that there are some numbers that jump out immediately to you. And when you start looking at those particular numbers, it's the numbers three, five, seven, and 10. The number three is associated with divine perfection, completeness, and manifestation. It is significant because it represents the presence of the whole Godhead in one. And then when you start looking at what happened in three days with God, coming in the flesh as man, living 33 years, and then when he dies, he comes back in three days. This number is powerful. Then when you start looking at the number five, the number five is associated with the idea of grace. Our pastor just preached on that last Sunday, this past Sunday. So then we're looking at this number five that is associated with grace, God's goodness and his favor. It represents God's generosity and his kindness towards humanity. You start looking at five and all the things that happen in the scripture, the five loaves and what God did feeding 5,000. And when you start looking at the five-fold ministry 
and how those gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were being gifts of grace to the body of Christ. Then you start looking at the five virgins, the ones that were prepared, and then we're looking at the five of the ones that were not prepared. It emphasizes the importance of readiness and us being spiritually prepared for the return of Christ. Then when you look at the number seven, the number seven is considered completion or perfection in the Bible. It is associated with God's work. It's associated with seven days of creation. It talks about it in the apocalyptic literature and the completion of God's plan. And you start looking at Revelations, and in Revelation it talks about the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. When you start looking at these numbers, and then the number 10, the number 10, the number 10 signifies completeness, fullness, and order. It is often associated with the law of the commandments in the book of Exodus when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses at Mount Sinai representing the moral codes and the divine order for the Israelites. So when you see three, you see five, you see seven, and you see ten. Now I'm giving you this teaching to get you to understand that if any one of them numbers is lining up with your family, you ought to snatch what's put to that number because that number is telling you you got an anointing that number is telling you that things are in order that number is telling you that things are complete and you don't need the gates of hell trying to tell you who you are when God's already set a system to remind you that you're already complete so so what you're at home with three and you're looking for four and four hadn't come yet you already got it going on wish I had a witness in here you're a single mother with two kids and you're waiting on some man to walk through the door. God's trying to tell you, you're already perfected if you will look at it through my lens. And so when you start looking at this text and you start seeing the fact that he has, you know, the 5,000 animals and the, and, and the 500 animals and the 3,000 animals and the 500 and then the text says that he's got seven sons, three daughters. Gender-wise, in the male capacity, they're complete. Daughter-wise, without the male, they're already complete. And then even when we put them together as brothers and sisters as number 10, they're already complete. So he's trying to show you who you are and get this. Everybody's great and everybody's under attack. Nobody gets a chance to not be under attack. So stop crying because the pressure is on. Stop crying because the heat is on. If anything, you ought to be saying, I must be really great. Because if the enemy's coming after me like this, there must be a sign that he has dropped something on my life and he's deposited something in me that the enemy has recognized before I've had a revelation of what God has already done for me in my life. See, the thing is, the enemy was already here from the beginning. So he knows what God wants to do in your life. You're having a problem with the issue. And the devil's trying to say, if I can keep him stuck in the issue, if I can keep him, if I can keep him repeating the problem, they'll never jump into the solution. And the solution is the Holy Ghost. I wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them, you're on the right side. See, that, that, that right there should have got you. Tell somebody, I'm on the right side. Because what that is, I'm trying to encourage you because you think you're on the wrong side because your bills ain't being paid. You, 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 they're trying to repo something from you. Your man has done something to you. Your woman has done something to you. It's not adding up like you wanted to add up, but God told me to remind you, you're on the right side. Just because you feel pressure, that mean you're on the wrong side. Tell somebody, I'm on the right side. It just happens to be a hell of a day. Somebody shout hallelujah. So I start looking at it. If you paid attention to the text that we read, he couldn't finish one conversation. So 
soon as somebody started telling him what was happening, come here, sir. Soon as he, he to, it came up and told him I was doing this and, and doing that, and it got his attention before he could finish the conversation. Come here, sir. Before he could finish the conversation, he's telling him I, I was doing such and such, and, and before I was the only one that got away, and before he could walk away, he, he came, and he was talking, and, and he hadn't forgot what he said yet. He's still trying to internalize it, and while he's talking, then he came and, and, and compounded on top of the trauma of what he just found out, and before he could finish this conversation, then somebody else came to tell him something else, and he's listening, and he's trying to deal with what he heard first, and he still ain't really processed what he heard next, but now he's talking to him, and while he's talking to him, he, he's trying to internalize it. He, he, he don't even have time to cry. He, he don't even have time to take a breath, because before he could finish with him. And remember, he never finished with him. And he never finished with him. And he never finished with him. And by the time he got to her, he's listening. And you don't see anywhere in the text, in the text where he says, hold it. Give me, just give me a minute. Let me catch my breath. Nowhere in the text does he have a chance to catch his breath. And before he finishes with her, she comes up to tell him the most detrimental nerves and tell them, your children have been killed that a natural disaster has come upon you come around me so all I got is my relationship with God but yet I'm surrounded by the trauma that was brought up to me the entire night so I'm sitting here looking at everything that the enemy brought to me but yet I'm trying to keep my eyes stayed on Jesus it's difficult to keep my mind on him when my mind is on what they told me so now I'm sitting here surrounded by trauma this is a hell of a day I know this ain't for everybody but if there's some of you that can just testify I've been there if some of you can say I'm there right now I, it took everything in me to get to church because I had a day like what you're talking about right now. I came here to preach to you because you're surrounded by bills and surrounded by death and surrounded by bad information and surrounded by what the doctor said, but yet you're still trying to praise him and you're still trying to lift him up. You're still trying to serve and you're still trying to give him glory and you hadn't been able to catch your breath. I want you to look at somebody real quick and tell them take 10 seconds and catch your breath. Oh yeah, come on, come on, come on, tell them catch your breath. I care about you. God put me beside you for a reason, for you to catch your breath. I know everybody's pulling on you and everybody's demanding from you. Everybody wants you to pay bills. Everybody wants you to be the answer to the problem. Everybody wants to see you counsel them and you haven't had a chance to take a break for yourself. You haven't been able to process what's going on with your own self because you have to fix everything for everybody else. God told me to tell you, catch your breath. Thank you. Somebody praise him right now. Praise him for him. Oh, catch your breath. Catch your breath. Catch your breath. I know you say, well, pastor, how can I catch my breath and praise him? Because you're resting in the circumstance. I wish I had a witness. I'm resting in what he says. So everybody, if you need to catch your breath, catch a praise real quick. seated before before he could before he could move on they kept bringing bad news bad news you know three, year, three and a half years I've been here in Dallas and I left my church. I left my job. I left my friends. 
came to work for the greatest orator on the planet. The best of times and the worst of times. Dealing with the loss of my own personal ministry. And then my oldest son dies, 27 years old. By the time I can process that, my grandfather's about to die. We're just waiting on him to die. Some kind of way God brought him back, but the process of watching him die. And then my daddy died. And I sit in the room for three weeks with my father and watched him die. Stayed with him until he took his last breath and told him, go on, daddy. And watched him die. And then tried to muster up enough courage to come be normal. I don't even know what normal is anymore. I've got my own troubles, my own personal problems, yet alone my family, my parents, siblings, and none of that happened in one day. It happened over time, and that was difficult and is difficult to this day. But for this man, for what to happen, one conversation after another, and after another, and after another, and after another, made me stick my chest up and say, God, Thank you for giving me a little time to catch my breath. But the character in our text did not have the liberty to catch his breath. He had to figure out, how do I take my next step? What could possibly happen next? See, you, you haven't had real trauma till you're afraid to even get out your bed. And I shouldn't say that. That's not right. Trauma is on different levels, so I take that back. But for those of us that it got scary, I don't know if I should even go to work. I don't even know if I should talk to them. I don't even know if I should get up. I'm contemplating killing myself. I don't even know if I still want to be here. That's a whole nother level that is compounded trauma over time. That makes you even question your relationship with God. But the character in our text tonight, he gives us courage and he gives us a blueprint for how to suffer and he does not ever do what the gates of hell wanted him to do I wish I had somebody here that caught that Satan went to talk to God told God I'm walking to and fro, man's abode, where you gave man dominion, I'm walking in it. Where you gave man power, where you gave man liberty, I'm strolling through it. He's coming through what you have dominion over. See, that's where you got to catch it. I wish I had some Bible readers and some praises in there. If you got dominion over it, it doesn't matter how much he walks through it. You can walk through it all you want, but you don't have the power to take it from it because I know how great I really am. That's why he tries to catch you with compounded pressure because you will forget 
who you are in God. But if I had at least 100 people in here that know who they are, it doesn't matter how much you stroll through my garden, stroll through my house, stroll through my job, keep on walking, because I'm walking right with you. Wish I had a witness here. And I'm anointed to drive you out of here. Somebody shout hallelujah. How many Holy Ghost, how many devil chasing, how many Holy Ghost busting demon chasers do we have in here right now? Look at somebody and tell them he gave you an anointing to destroy the yoke. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. That means dismantle. That means break. I don't have to put up with you. I'm going to break your stronghold. Somebody shout hallelujah. You see this? So I thought about it. I thought about it. He didn't have a chance to catch his breath. He's dealing with what he does. And he takes his oxen. Oxen are burden beasts, beasts of burden. And when he takes those, he's pretty much in his field. And so some of the hell that some of you are going through right now, you can't have church, but you're just here because you just got to get here. Is because the devil's in your field. He's in your job. Your boss. The person you used to befriend. The person you trained. The person you got the job with. You can't even enjoy the break time anymore because who you work with, you can't even talk around no more. They're such a poisonous person. Now you've got to figure out how to navigate in your own career that you prayed for. God gave you the job, but then now you want to quit it. No, 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 no. Don't quit the job because now you're telling the devil you've got territory over what God gave me dominion over. You can't take over where God gave me an anointing to take over. So you've got to straighten up yourself and realize you may be in my field, but I still got the power. Wish I had a witness here. You may be in here planting. You may be in here robbing. You may be in here stealing. I ain't quitting. Why would I quit? I'm going to stand and I'm going to give God glory right in your face. I wish I had a witness in here. I know, I know, I know. Don't nobody on your job know you praise God. Nobody on your job know you're saved. Don't nobody on your job know your Holy Ghost feel. Well, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those of us. Everybody on my job know I love him. And if you mess with me, I'll hikamo shall run DOC right up in this classroom. Somebody give God glory. If you got a serious praise, break out in it right now. I feel the Holy Ghost on that thing. He's on, he's in your field. When I started thinking about Philippians, be seated. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, our prayer, supplication, with, I wish I had somebody here. Tell somebody with. See, y'all praying and miserable with Thanksgiving. Y'all praying and don't want him to answer. You're just, in, you're just in routine. He said prayer, supplication with Thanksgiving. You ought to be giving God glory right in front of your enemy's face. Oh, you want me to quit? Father, I thank you. I thank you for this job. I give you glory for this job. I speak peace over this job. You want me to leave? I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to give him glory right in your face. Somebody give God glory. He said, do it with thanksgiving. See, that's the missing ingredient. We praying. We giving God glory. But we're not thankful about it. He said, let your request be made known to God. See, that's the part right there. Not being made known to your best friend. That's part of your problem. You telling them before you tell him. 
No, 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 no. Flip the order. Let me tell God. Because you'd be surprised when you tell God, God may whisper to the one you're praying about and tell them, leave my child. Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. Tell somebody, try it. Try it right now. Try it right now. We ain't waiting until we get home. We're going to talk about it now. If you got somebody on your job bothering you, pray that prayer. God! Good God Almighty. Let your request be made known. Watch this. And the peace of God would surpass it. I can't take 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 it. The peace of God that surpasses it. Look at somebody and say, all, 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 all understand. I don't think they caught that. Tell somebody, I said, all. Even the peace that you didn't tell nobody. Even the part of the story that you kept to yourself. Even the part that you don't want to let the counselor know. Even the part that you kept in your mind. Even the part that is driving you insane. He said, the peace that surpasses it. Tell somebody, oh. He said, he said, he said, he said. He said, it surpasses all understanding. But he says, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All right? So, as you deal with the enemy in your field, dealing with difficulty, with people that are trying to take your job, discredit you on your job, that tension on your job is normal. And don't let the enemy run you out because of what you feel. You take control over what you feel. And you need to understand that as you seek peace, is what the scripture says, you got to pursue the peace. And understand this, if you don't get anything, you may not always get closure. Oh, y'all ain't saying nothing to me tonight. But those of you that just got to get an explanation, you may not get closure. But if I don't get closure, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding is going to guard my heart. So you, I may not be able to talk to you, but because I'm talking to God, he'll guard my mind and keep me from losing it because of the mess that you've been spreading about. I wish I had a witness in here. I only talk to those who had a hell of a day. I feel all right tonight. I love what Peter says. He says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I got to move. The second area was the servants. That they took the edge of the sword and they killed the servants. The servants represent your support. When hell comes against your support system, Sometimes we read our support wrong because we're always selfish in our interpretation that they should always be there for us. But there are going to be times when your support is under attack too. And I don't need to be there for you right now. Right now, I need you to be there for me. And so if I've got to always be there for you, then maybe this is a season for us to detach. Uh, I'm not saying that we're not going to, I'm not saying that we're not going to come back together. But what I am saying is, if I got to always be your cheerleader and disregard what I'm going through, and you don't see this sword that's in my side, and you keep wanting me to talk to you about the sword that's in your side, 
then you're telling me that what I feel is not important to you. And that what you're going through is higher and you think you're more valuable than I am. So let me moonwalk out of this relationship. Now it's going to hurt me because I have spent a lot of time trying to get to know you. But I'd rather digress and find somebody else who will look at me and say, I hear you. Instead of somebody ignoring me with this wound in my side. Wish I had a witness in here. Look at somebody and tell them it's time for you to be a better support system. Quit always leading the conversation about what you're going through. Ask them, how can I? How can I be there for you? The, the support were killed. They were killed. Your support system under attack. So the enemy knows that though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two can withstand him. And he says in a three-four cord is not easily broken. So he knows that strength is in being with one accord. The strength is in the two of you being in the same spirit, being like-minded and having God a part of the relationship leading you through the traumatic situation. But if he can get tension between the two of you because of the hell that you're going through, then he already says, I've got a greater chance to attack them because they can't get on the same page. And so many of us, you don't realize that the enemy is watching your playbook. And he knows that you don't get along with nobody. There is a reason for that. You're not just that way. The enemy is working behind the scenes to keep you by yourself. Because all you're going to do is get mad and walk away anyway. So he knows what he will do is put you in a cycle all over again. You'll meet a group of people this year and you'll feel like God has taken you to another level. And by Christmas, y'all will break up. Uh, I wish I had a witness here. You'll find somebody else in spring break and you'll feel like you're completely in love. And then by New Year's of 24, you'll have to get rid of them because God's given you a new revelation. I I wish I had a witness in here. You've got to catch this devil that's trying to sow discord in your relationships and break his back and tell him you ain't going to ruin another relationship in my life. They may have come against me wrong, but I'm going to use the power of forgiveness to mend this relationship. I wish I had a witness in here. Somebody shout hallelujah. Good God, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. I got to thinking, PT, about, since we're talking about support, I got to thinking about Elisha. And when the city was besieged and his helper had went out to see what was going on, he came back, told him, he said, hey, there's no way we're going to get out of here. It's too many of them. We don't have enough support to fight this kind of battle. Now, 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 I thank God for friends that that are come tell you the truth. I'm, I'm not against that. But I wish I had some friends that had some power. Got no whip, I got no, I'm talking for somebody right now. You ain't said nothing. Woo, I feel close. Let me tell you something. I'm trying to calm down. I feel some. I feel something. <laughs> Elisha's servant says, that, that, "How are we gonna get out of this? They got us completely surrounded." And then and Elijah just kept on chilling because Elijah understood that he had greater support. <laughs> I ain't got no witnesses in here right now. Elijah said, "He said. He said. He said. He said. He said. Let me." Let me tell you something. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. He said, he said, Lord, open his eyes. 
Oh, I wish I had a witness in here. He said, he said, Lord, open his eyes. And so when he prayed for him, the Bible says that the servant opened his eyes and he saw chariots and he saw horses and men on fire. They was on the hills. They were all around him. And then Elijah looked at him and told him, he said, I told you, those that are with us are more than those that are against us. That's why you got to have the right kind of support. I know you want to tell me what everybody is saying, but can you see what everybody else can't see? That we've got supernatural support. They're sitting by waiting on the enemy saying, I wish you would. Oh, have I got a witness in here? Look at somebody and tell them you got angelic support. You got an angel saying, I wish you would. I wish you would swing at her. I wish you would say something about her. I wish you would cuss her out because I'm standing right here. You've not only got friends, but you've got angels that's watching over you. Somebody give your supernatural support a praise right now. Put that organ in the house. Put it in the monitor so I can hear it. Come on, give him praise. 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 Ah, uh, now that would be good if it was for me, but I said give it to God because you got supernatural support. These are not people that the enemy can see. But this is God's supernatural support. God said, I got something for you. God said, I got an angel for you. And it doesn't matter what's going on. You might be by yourself. But I, I, I. Tell somebody God's got your back. God Almighty. I hear the Lord saying, if you'll catch that, you'll walk away seeing it. Have I got a witness here? You ain't gonna have to ask nobody. Open her eyes. Open his eyes. Everywhere you go, you're gonna see it. I see you. 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 I, now that changes how you go through. When you know you've got supernatural support, that's how you walk through the valley of shadow of death. Fearing no evil. Why? Tell somebody he's with me. Oh, there ain't nobody in here that want to praise God tonight. Tell somebody he's with me. You may not be with me, but God is. You may not like me, but God does. You may not want to leave with me, but God will. You may not go in the house with me, but God will. God! Tell somebody God will. Tell somebody else God will. Oh, yes. Somebody caught it. Somebody caught it. If you know you got supernatural support, then come on and praise him like it. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Come on, praise him. Praise him like you got it. Because it ain't like you got it. You already got it. Wait till the battle's over! Shout! Shout! Ah, yeah! Shout right now! Yeah! Oh, yes! I'm trying to teach it. But I feel my help here. Tell somebody you've got some.
support. You may not have child support, but you got God support. Your family may not like you, but tell your neighbor God does. Everybody may be against you, but God isn't. And I don't care how much hell you're going through. God told me to tell you, you got more heaven that's coming instead of hell. So let hell know, I'm not going to tell you nothing. But when you see me coming, glory's coming with me. Power's coming with me. And anointing is coming with me. Peace is coming with me. Mercy is coming with me. Grace is coming with me. Everything that God said I can have is coming with me. You're not alone. God is with you. Heaven's got your back. Angels are surrounding you. It doesn't matter. Yeah, come on, catch that, catch that. Don't let that die, catch that, catch it. He trying to give you something, catch it. I'm not gonna stop it, catch it. That's God trying to let you realize who's with you, that you got something with you. You got power with you. You're not in here by yourself. I know you had a hell of a day, but God told me to tell you heaven is with you. Don't worry about what hell is saying. Heaven is saying I'm speaking to you. Come on. Come on, praise him. God Almighty, put that organ up here so I can hear it. Come on, somebody, shout hallelujah. I heard God told me, he said, if you'll just give me real praise, you'll see it for yourself. You listening to what I'm saying, and I know feet come by hearing, but if you will just praise him, you'll see what you, with your own eyes, the kind of help that God has sent down for you. God. That's it right there. Somebody caught it right there. That's it. When you catch it, you start giving them glory. Because what you got is going home with you. What you got is getting up in the morning with you. When you go to work, he's got you. That's what he's trying to get you to see. You don't need a preacher. God already gave you everything that you got. Wish I had a witness in here. Catch that glory and know that you got us a supernatural supporter that's trying to tell you I'll escort you into your destiny. <laughs> 